and say good morning to all of you and welcome to Classroom 2 O Live. We are so glad to have you here with us and we have a great topic for you today. We are going to be talking about MOOCs and I know for me that was a very confusing word and concept for a very long time. So I am thrilled to have Vereen here to share her experience with the MOOC course she created. So not only are we going to get to learn about how MOOCs work, but we're also going to get to see some fabulous content in the course that she developed for digital citizenship. And I just know that you're going to find resources there that you're going to want to use with your own students students and parents and teachers in your schools. So our special guests today are Brina Roberts and Steve Hargadon and they're both they both have some great things to share with us. <coughs> Do want to let you know that we are recording and all of our recordings are posted on our archives and resources page on our website. So uh, shortly after the show is over, we'll get the full Illuminate or Blackboard Collaborate recording posted and then a little bit later we'll have the recording. The Live Binder links will also be there. And now is the time for you to do something. So this is where you go over there, click on that starburst, and place yourself on the map. So you, you may need to double click on that starburst just to the left of the map. There you go. Now we're seeing them come up. It's always so great to see where everyone is located. We've got lots of West Coast people. That's interesting. A few on the East Coast, certainly Canada. And Shambles is way over there in Thailand, and we love it when he joins us. Okay, I hope that you've all been able to place those. I see somebody put a green check and that's terrific too. Is that Virginia? Not sure who that is, but also type in the chat where you're located because that helps all of us to pin it down a little bit. I'm in Phoenix, Arizona, and <clears throat> today uh, Kim is co-moderating with me as well as Lori Moffitt and Tammy <clears throat> is doing our um, uh, closed captioning for us. We have such an awesome team of people and it's so great to have the support of everyone here. Um, Lorna is away on a terrific weekend at Unplugged Canada. So she has no, no access to internet and she is very busy there. So we're looking forward to hearing from her next week when she gets back from unplugged. So huge thank you to Tammy, to Lori, and always to Kim Case who is my faithful co-moderator here in Classroom 2O Live. <clears throat> Okay, we're going to move on and I do want to let you know that we do have a live binder created as we do for every show and this is the link for the live binder and you'll find all of the resources that we're sharing today in that live binder and you'll also, I will also be adding any links that you may share with us in the chat to the live binder afterwards. So it's a great one-stop shopping place for you to go back and take a closer look at the things that are being shared today. And we're going to do a few quick poll questions. So this is your chance to use that little drop-down polling tool. And this is a yes-no question. We'd like to know if you've ever participated in an online course before. So give us a yes, a green check if you have, and a red X if you have not. Looking good. Look at all the people that have already been in online courses. This is so awesome. 
Okay, and I'm going to quickly publish those results so that you can get a sense of our participation there. It looks like, unless there are people who can't find that voting option, that almost all of you have participated in an online course. So that is great to know. Okay, now, have you ever participated in a MOOC before? And that is short, and I got to Oh, you got it cleared. OK. Have you ever participated in a MOOC, which is a massive open online course? So that's a little bit different than just a regular online course. Terrific. Oh, it's great to see that many of you have. That's good. Roxanne, thanks. That's great to know. They are just so powerful. So you're going to learn all about why and how to participate and even how to create your own online MOOCs in this session today. So over half of us have participated and 33% have not. Thank you so much. All right, and here's the question now where we're going to change our voting tools to A, B, C, D, E. And now where that check was, you're going to see those letters. And I want you to choose which of those roles is your role in education. And if it's anything other than what we've included on our list, please select Other and type it in the chat. Great. We have quite a spread there. Good. So glad to have some administrators here, some secondary, uh, post-secondary teachers, and I'm sure we have some distance learning instructors here. That is great. And this can be so helpful to Verena to know what your uh, perspective is in coming to this session. So I will just publish those for you. And we have quite a range, as you can see. Uh, very balanced, but everything but uh, administrator is chosen there. Uh, no, yeah. Administrator. Uh, and it could be that maybe you haven't found that polling place yet. So thanks for voting. All right. Well, I am now thrilled to introduce our special guest for today, and that is Brina Roberts, who is the course designer of the DigiFoot 12 course. There are so many things that I could say about her, but I do want to give just a little background about her and then to tell you what a fabulous experience I've had following her DigiFoot 12 course. She has worked as both a face-to-face -face teacher and an online teacher for over 14 years. She's been in private and public schools in Western Canada, Montreal, and even in Singapore. She's taught from pre-K to university. And she's also engaged in her own learning, working on a Master's of Educational Technology. And her newest position brand new as of maybe two days ago. She's joining the Alberta Distance Learning Center as a team teacher who's going to support learning resource development. And she, one of her jobs is going to be the development of MOOCs that will be designed for the uh, students there. So it's very exciting that she's going to get to put all this to work. So there are so many things we can learn by being connected educators. So with that introduction, I want to say welcome to you, Brina, and ask you to respond to our newbie question and take over with your presentation. So what is a MOOC exactly? And how is it relevant to K-12 education? Hi, Peggy. Thank you so much. If everyone can hear me, you can uh, put a happy face down or just to make sure that my audio is working. Um, Paula's right. Oh, there we go. I see the happy faces. They always make me happy. Um, Paula's right. A MOOC is a massive open online course. And I'm going to talk a little bit about how I took the concept of a MOOC and brought it to K-12 education because Massive is the first word in MOOC, but I would say it's more meaningful. Meaningful open online, um, oh sorry, meaningful open online course. Um, 
at, in a K-12 setting. Uh, the massive uh, doesn't always, it isn't always important in my opinion and, uh, and it's more of a higher education thing where you have thousands of people taking a course, but I like it when it's much smaller and more meaningful. So I'll just get started to explain a little bit. I'd like to read something to you to give you an idea of where we're going, the direction today. Rather than thinking of public education as a burden that schools must shoulder on their own, what would it mean to think of a public education as a responsibility of a more distributed network of people and institutions? What would it mean to enlist help in this endeavor from an engaged and diverse set of publics that are broader than what we traditionally think of as an educational and civic institutions? In addition to publics that are dominated by adult interests, these publics should include those that are relevant and accessible to kids now, where they can find role models, recognition, friends, and collaborators who are co-participants in the journey of growing up in a digital age. This is um, written by Mimi Ito in um, a fantastic book, which we have referenced later. And it, it spoke to me because I really wanted to bridge that gap between school and the public world. How do we get everyone involved in education? So how, why and how to make a K-12 MOOC? What ignited the idea? Well, professionally, I'm the CEO, the Chief Education Officer for GlobalEd.com, or sorry, GlobalEd.ca, just saw my first typo. And what I was doing was I uh, completed a pilot of the online ESL blended program, which was creating a blended ESL program to students in China. And we used Moodle, um, but we were very restricted by Moodle uh, because we couldn't edit it in any way. Um, there was a group of teachers, Shannon Polson, who's here today, and Jamie Wright and myself, created this project. Um, and we learned that we had to figure out how to bridge the online learning that is out there, the open online learning, and figure out how to meet the needs of our students. And I was also looking around for the most cutting edge blended learning options for next year. And I saw this picture, and it appealed to me. And if you look at it, I don't know if it would appeal to everyone, but it appealed to me. <laughs> and it is the beginning of the idea of the MOOC. Personally, what ignited the idea even more is honestly, I am a parent, and I am frustrated with the lack of continuity and technology integration in my children's classrooms. Uh, I wanted to see what there was online for parents to teach their children about social media and digital citizenship. You see in the cartoon it says, I appreciate the text, Kate, but next time you can just raise your hand. I do get a little um, frustrated, I guess, with uh, the fact that my kids aren't getting a lot of technology integration in their schools. So rather than complain about it, I thought I would do something. And I think about this poem often. This really represents me, I would say. The Voice by Shel Silverstein, and many of you probably know it. There is a voice inside of you that whispers all day long. I feel that this is right for me. I know that this is wrong. No teacher, preacher, parent, friend, or wise man can decide. What's right for you, just listen to the voice that speaks inside. So. I had to decide to start listening to that voice a little more. I knew something was wrong, and I needed to do something about it. Has your inner voice ever told you to do something? Did you knew it wasn't wrong, but you knew it might, you might be alone with your idea? You knew that you would be facing the challenge on the road less traveled? So I'm asking you, can you write in the box, did you listen to your inner voice, or did you ignore it? <laughs> I want to see what you guys have to say about it. Do you listen to those inner voices? You can say yes or no. Yes. Oh, Steve, yeah, I believe you listen. <laughs> Good. Inner voices. That's right. Inner voices often get you in trouble, but they often um, help innovation. Excellent. What I like to see. Lots of uh, enthusiasm. My inner voice kept saying, I need to find a way to bridge technology and learning outside the classroom walls. And these MOOC things seemed like a cutting edge online learning solution. And the website said, register here. So I thought I would just join the MOOC. What is a MOOC, for those of you who are waiting for this? It is a massive online course, which was coined by Dave Cormier and Brian Alexander. And it's based on the idea of connectivism, created by Stephen Downs and George Siemens. 
really it means that learning is out there and needs to be found and connected through networks. And these networks can be social media, or they can be people, or they can be digital tools. The idea of a network is a little, is a little foggy and all over. Learners are autonomous and yet they are also dependent on other learners, which is kind of a dichotomy. And learners use social media tools and networks to learn from each other and with each other. And that's what I really liked about it. Then I started looking at more pictures and became even more confused, just like Peggy uh, talked about <laughs> before. And if you look at, you can't really see the picture here on the left, but it, uh, it demonstrates that MOOCs are very confusing. And they really, nobody really knew what was going on. And we see a lot of flowing and networks and up and down and all things going on. Um, but they, they didn't give me a clear understanding of what to expect with a MOOC. So question number two, how many of you are risk takers or innovators? So can you say yes if you're a risk taker or innovator? That would be great. MOOCs are definitely not linear paths, which we'll get on to. Yes, most of you, yes, usually, risk taker. Outstanding, yes, sometimes, good. Sometimes it's good. OK, we'll go on. So the Change 11 MOOC, and some of you were participants in this as well, um, I have heard. I jumped in on Alex Kuros week, which was week 29. So this was a course that I believe went to week 35. Someone could tell me if I'm wrong on that. but. Week 29 of the MOOC was about understanding digital citizenship. Alec Kouros is a leading professor out of the University of Regina. And I had heard of him before, but I'd never listened to him before. So you just jump right in, you listen. And I listened and participated in Alex's session. And I wondered, how come I've never experienced this kind of online learning before? I've been an online uh, distributed learning teacher for about four years now, and I'd never seen anything quite like this. How could I apply it to the K-12 audience? That was my first thinking. Why aren't we doing this? Is there a K-12 MOOC? What does it look like? How, who would want to help me create a MOOC for K-12? So I have to admit, I did call and email and check in with quite a few people to see who would support me on this. And I have to say that I give a big hug to Steve because I sent him an email out of the blue. He didn't know who I was. And he said, I like the idea. Let's see what we can do. And that's a big part of this course and why it happened, because somebody listened to me and gave me a voice. So what makes the difference between a MOOC and a regular online course is you listen to weekly synchronous, there are weekly synchronous meeting times. The teachers and the experts give you their contact information. That blew me away, that teachers are wanted you and encouraged you to connect with them and interact with them. There were a variety of systems to interact and connect with others. They used flipped learning strategies. And flipped learning is where you get the content ahead of time if you don't know about it. Um, and so they, you either have videos or you have um, readings or things that you do ahead of time so that when you're listening to the synchronous meeting time, you have a better understanding of what's going on. And you can interact with these amazing professionals and experts. Your content is given in digital font format. You have a choice of activities as opposed to being told what you have to do. And activities are presented in an open forum for feedback for all. There is no formal assessment, usually, no exams or, or uh, tests or quizzes, although there are MOOCs in higher education that play with these rules a bit. And all activities are presented using social media. However, as usual, what I thought was missing in Change 11 as a K-12 uh, audience, as the course progressed, I learned that not every lead facilitator was like Alec Kouros. He is unique, and I was almost spoiled that I started the course with him. I started the course late and full of enthusiasm, and then I felt alone. And this is something that happens a lot in online courses. So I lost that aspect of a, a learning community, even though that's what the MOOCs were all about. I was expected to figure out how to connect, network, create a blog, link my RSS feed, and use my Twitter before I could even complete activities all by myself. 
And I wasn't really sure how to do that. And there weren't clear instructions on that. And, and while instructions aren't important, sometimes you need some guidance and some scaffolding for beginners to include everyone. So I began to feel excluded from the community and did not know how to connect with the like-minded people for support. And it wasn't until I did uh, a little survey at the end that I found out there were many people in the same position as me, and we just could not figure out a way to connect. So I started to think I wanted to create a course like Change 11 that could teach others how to use social media and discover their digital footprints, giving everyone time to do it, scaffolded support, um, and that created an encouraging digital learning environment for all. And I wanted to take the higher education move and put a K-12 stamp on it. So do you consider yourself an educational entrepreneur, the new trendy word now? Are you willing to create something new and innovative for your students? You can say yes, or you can say no. Yes, excellent, look at that, yes and no. Excellent, good to hear. Wow, definitely yes. <laughs> So this is a big question. If you create a new project or when you're creating new projects, do you learn as much as your students? Again, yes. More. Oh, that's a good answer. More. Well, I was kind of in a trend where I wasn't learning as much as my students because I was focusing on content and the same old, same old. So that's why I need to change it up. I needed to think about I need to learn as much as my students and be open to it. So. In Digifoot or in MOOCs, everyone learns. As a parent, I wanted to choose topics that I would want my child's teacher to cover in some way during the school year. So I chose general topics, hoping that my children's teachers genuinely would hear about the course and be able to start somewhere. And I have to be honest that the first day when we opened the Digifoot course, one of the teachers who signed up and had no idea that I was doing it was one of the teachers in my son's school, and she, she taught grade two, and he's still in, he's going into grade one. Unfortunately, she's left, <laughs> but she did sign up for the course, and that proved to me that there's, um, there's a future and there's hope. And that was on the first day that the course started, so I couldn't have asked for anything more. As an educator, I knew that I wanted open content resources so that anyone anywhere could have access to them anytime. I wanted something to be collaborative where people could find a link to what they have learned. So I wanted not only a place where you could have the resources that we've all collected and put together, but I wanted other people to be able to link to what they've done so they could feel some pride in it. So these are the topics after some consideration that I thought everyone could learn from. Week one is building a PLN, a personal learning network. Twitter, we use Twitter because it um, was the key tool that was used in other MOOCs for social networking, but you could use other social networking tools. Um, week three, digital citizenship. And digital footprint is all over this in different ways, but digital citizenship was such a key important part uh, in almost every aspect of what we did. Researching online, so we have our librarians that week, and they gave us a big idea, um, some big ideas on what we could do with researching online. Students as educators, I needed to emphasize the idea that students had just as much of a voice as anyone else. And, and we had wonderful students come and present that week, which is all online and all saved, which is fantastic. Cyberbullying, and finally, a badge ceremony. And I want to mention the badge ceremony because when people first started looking at my course when I was talking about it to others, they said, this isn't a course because there's no assessment. There's no evaluation. And that is still old school, and I'm still dealing with that, but the badge system met the needs for this course, and we'll talk a little bit more about that, but the assessment still niggles me and have that inner voice that I'm talking about. We focused on the seven degrees of connectedness. Actually, these seven degrees of connectedness, I'm sure Lorna is talking about right now because they were developed by three people from the Unplugged Canada, and um, that's Rod Lucien, Zoe, and Sylvan, Sylvania, Sylvan, I can't remember. I have all their names written, though, for you. And I'm going to go to the next page because it helps you read, see it a bit more. The seven degrees of connectedness are the ideas that everyone can connect in their own way and nothing is bad. But until we make these connections, we're not really getting to that meaningful learning that I'm 
trying to allude to. So they start out with the lurker, the novice, the insider, the colleague, the collaborator, the friend, and the confidant. And I'm sure that all of us as connected learners can think of people who are we relate to in different levels of our own connectedness um, and that we trust in different ways. And I can think of even lurker, really the lurker, that's what I focus on when I'm Twitter, doing any Twitter tweets. I don't do a lot of information about myself, but as you get to know people, for example, Peggy and I have become very good friends, and it's all online. Everything's online. This is what I'm talking about in an online world. Eventually, you meet all your people, all your friends face to face, too. So we're quickly going to go over the Digifoot course itself, and some of you know it quite well. Um, Peggy, can I just get you to load it in for me because it's not going, it's not <laughs> playing. Sure, you want me to load the wiki? Yes, please. Sorry. Okay. It's one second here. It's not working. Sometimes it's, it's a right. bandwidth Thanks. thing. Yeah, I've got it coming up here. Thank you. Now, when you look at this, you might have to pull it down a bit, everyone. Use the cursor on the side to pull it down. Yes, you'll want to do your own scrolling on that page. I'm seeing it now, so I'm hoping all of you are. Can you give me a green check if you're seeing um, the website now? Great. Thanks a lot. Okay. Now, um, as I say, I'm not going to go into I'm going to try to move my chat. There we go. A lot of detail on this, but if you, if you, it is a wiki, which is an open um, online tool that anyone can use, and that is the point of the whole DigiFoot course. I wasn't pretending I was a teacher who didn't know what I was doing. I really am a teacher who doesn't know what I'm doing. And so I wanted to push the limits of how can you make an online course for free, everything is for free, without using LMS. And LMS stands for Learning Management Systems. And I'm quite familiar with Moodle and Desire to Learn and Blackboard and course sites and many other possible tools. But I wanted to do this to prove that anyone can do this anywhere. And how hard would that be? So this is a wiki space. And if you, go, if you cursor down to the left, on, um, on the right hand side, on the left hand side you'll see all my pages. And you're not, I'm not going to be able to show you the different pages, so you're going to have to go and play with this yourself. But I wanted just to show you quickly that the, the key information is in one area, and you have your home, your badge tracker, your course information. I'm stuck, I need some support, participation, privacy, registration resources, and tracking your footprint, and I will go over all this. But then the week one, week two, week three, week four, week five, week six, and week seven, every single week was created by the person who was the lead detective for the week. And we called them detectives because we were discovering our digital footprint. But um, that meant that the person who I actually didn't know, the only person who I actually knew in this course, well, I kind of know Steve, but um, it was Tracy Pulzer, who was the librarian for investigation skills week four. Every other person I'd met online or connected to in some way, and I had to trust that they would actually put their ideas into week two and also show up in the Illuminate Blackboard Illuminate session. I have to say the trust element is huge because as a teacher I'm so used to doing everything and having that control. And giving up trust um, was one of the hardest things with uh, creating a MOOC. But the learning was astronomical as a result. So I'm going to leave this and go back to the slides. Oops, there we go. And you can go and play with that a little more later. I didn't want to go to, into too much detail because I wanted to go on, show you this is, so these are the different parts. To create a MOOC, you have to have some central locations, um, although that could be argued with the higher education MOOCs. Um, I felt that it became too confusing when you could go absolutely anywhere. And a lot of people asked for some support and some um, specific areas to go to. So Wikispaces was the specific area that you go for content. Then 
we use Student 2.0, which is a partner, I guess you could say, and part of Classroom 2.0. And Student 2.0 was developed, if I'm right, Steve, you can write in the box if I'm totally off base, to give students a voice and try to get students to really be a part of the um, part of the educational reform movement, I guess, and give them a, a chance to explore what they want to learn their way. So the I, we kind of took over Student 2.0, as, as you can see if you go into it. So that was really, really appreciated that you have one area. Now, Student 2.0 is important because it's a Ning. And so therefore, it gave me one central location to have everybody's emails and addresses so that I could contact them if I needed to. They could decide whether they wanted the emails or not. Everything on this, remember, is about your own choice. So within an LMS, people are forced to receive your emails within, well, unless you go in and type it specifically, but generally um, you have to t accept what your teacher is telling you and listen to what your teacher is telling you. Whereas with Student 2.0 and NINGS, you uh, already you're giving the student more of a voice and or the learner more of a voice and more of an opportunity to decide the way they want to learn. We also use an amazing tool called Mighty Bell. And Mighty Bell is new and, and not everybody knows about Mighty Bell. Um, but Mighty Bell kind of is a mixture of Pinterest and uh, like just a, a variety of things like uh, Facebook is, uh, it is just a mixture of them all. But the best thing about it from a K-12 perspective is that it's all visual and you can see what people are putting in. So for example, you have a post right here that's just as big as a blog post. You can put videos in there. Um, and for, again, from that K to 12 position, I find that it's very organized, and the visual aspect of it makes it very easy for people to see and do um, and learn from. It also is a great tool to actually use with K to 12 students. Um, and I noticed most people have no problems linking into it, and they they really picked it up quite quickly. Although I think it was Paula who pointed out to me that you have to be 13 or over. And Paula, you could tell me if that's for sure as well. Finally, there were some teachers who felt a little apprehensive, teachers in particular, some librarians, um, educators, educators, and they didn't want to be totally open. They weren't ready to make that totally open step yet. So we used Edmodo as a scaffolding site, I guess you could say, and we created a group within Edmodo, and I know um, there were a couple of people here actually in Ed the Edmodo group, and they learned about Edmodo and played with Edmodo and posted on it. And again, Edmodo is a great tool to use within the classroom as well. Um, I know I, we've been using it in China, it's never let us down, and lots of teachers are using it across the United States. But in particular, Edmodo was used in the, Di the Digifoot course because it let people have some of that privacy that they were looking for. So now we're going to talk about really where MOOCs are going and why i really like you to consider them. So traditional online learning has made many attempts to connect and network. When we look out um, just at the infographics out there, we see what teachers want. They want more technology. They want affordable technology. They want web-based tools. They want to engage students. But over and over and over, I wonder how can they do that? What tools can they use to do that? Where are they going to have the time to do that? We see blog postings from like Ventspire.com, and they talk about the differences between what really matters in education and what's not so important, and how that there's if we look at the standardized testing and what's really being emphasized in education today, it's not necessarily what, what we want to emphasize. So fostering creativity and learning from failure and building relationships is on the other side or not included in the equation with standardized testing and grades and textbooks and everything else. We go back to Bloom's taxonomy. We look at the knowledge base. And this is content, content, content at the bottom. And as we go through Bloom's taxonomy, and this is what we learn in as teachers when we go to school, that we want to try to put a little bit of each of these levels into our, our lessons and our lesson plan. And as you go up, you see that the top is evaluation. And again, this is not necessarily the direction we want to go in. We want to promote creativity. So some teachers, and we can see this, it's, it's, it's coming out more and more, like Kathy Shoke have created, have changed the Bloom's taxonomy and changed it a bit. And they promoted the idea of creating as one of the strongest aspects of, of learning. And we've also got remembering, understanding, applying, analyzing, and evaluating. 
But when you look at this example, nothing's quite connecting. There's some touches, but evaluating isn't mixed with remembering, and evaluating isn't mixed with understanding. So that connected networking piece is still missing in this kind of example. If we look at the tree of knowledge, again, we have the idea that lots of ideas come up, and they come up, come up, and then they talk to one person, and talk to another person, and talk to another person. Oh, and I'm actually going to change this. And you have a whole bunch of ideas right here. And this could be, we could call this all the ideas that we've created in 1992. Then maybe up here we have all the ideas we've created in the year 2000. And they've all stemmed from the idea of education, education, and come up and expand it. But again, there's no necessarily connection. The leaves are separated. So some people, as we know, whoops, let me talk about it. Like Cheryl Nelson Beach have created um, a, a more forward-thinking knowledge tree where we have all sorts of different aspects and different ideas. That I, the, the concept that learning isn't just about, as I said, standardized testing, 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 and content, but it's all sorts of different ideas. But again, we're missing that, con that connection piece and the networking piece. How do we connect these if they're all separated? So if we have, uh, I guess we'll call that engineering over here and music over here. How could we connect the two? Uh, not quite doing it yet. The idea is there, but it's not quite happening. So why do the MOOC-like courses have a future in K-12? to Because they're able to connect all these different ideas, and I'll talk to you about that. You have to go back to the idea of the Renaissance man. If you think of Leonardo da Vinci, he was an amazing scholar, he was an amazing scientist, and he was an amazing artist, all in one, and he didn't differentiate between any of them. Everything was just as important as the other, and everything um, didn't happen without the other because everything was connected. Now, what I think is so fascinating is, look at this picture really closely, because Alec Kuros has created almost the identical picture in a networked learner or networked teacher. Fascinates me because what I think of when I see the network teacher is I think of the Renaissance man or Renaissance woman. We don't have to distinguish. But the idea that everything needs to be blended together, nothing's more important than the other, nothing works without the other. Everything has a place. Now, if you take this, and you start, sorry, it's a bit blurry on this one, and you start trying to connect things like the communication, the collaboration, the learning communications, and this is all surrounding the core competencies in the United States because they're so important. So you get the idea that there's some core information, because you do have your curriculum that you need to obviously complete, but you need to start in creating those connections, engaging them, and I'll start kind of twirling this on an axis, if you will, and twirling and twirling. And then you can actually visualize if you started twirling, twirling all those ideas, or even if you twirled the Renaissance man, you get into this big world of a system. And those systems lead to more and more ideas, and finally to a great big system with nodes of networks. And right here we have the focus point, but then as we go out, everything is connecting and linking together. This is the goal of MOOCs. This is the desire of the change in education, a, a new universe. That's right, Rhonda. Well, we hope so. But what I find interesting is that learning is a network, and it's part of a system. It's an interconnected set of elements that is coherently organized in a way that achieves something. It's more of a sum of its part, it, parts. It may exhibit adaptive, dynamic, goal-seeking, self-preserving, and evolutionary behavior. This is taken right from business systems um, uh, terminology. So it doesn't matter if you look at an ecosystem or a business system. They're all the same. And that systems is big everywhere right now. Uh, all over, uh, everyone's talking about it out in the news. But the networks and systems, that's the way that we're going to build on things together. So what I learned from this is I, my learning number one is I wanted to work on making all DigiFoot participants feel included. When I spoke to Alec Kouros, he reminded me to always make a daily email that includes examples of student work, because we all like to be the examples. That idea of making everyone special and focusing on their skills, it, which I've always tried to do as a teacher, just became so easy within a MOOC, because instantly you became, you, you were yourself. You were authentic, and you did the work that you wanted to do, and you did it well. Um, 
my learning to how to connect all the participants new to open learning. Participants, which I totally didn't expect, were beginners too advanced, and I needed to scaffold options for the new learners while challenging my advanced learners, which happens in your regular classroom as well. MOOCs naturally offered that personified or personalized learning option. But what I had to do was I had to ask participant mentors to volunteer to help model and help me, to write comments anytime they saw something unanswered, to help me moderate Blackboard sessions, to help me with Twitter, um, the lists, and, and to use NetVibes, to help me with the Google Docs and other various tools, I encouraged others to lead in order to make the course sustainable for me. So when we talk about teachers being overwhelmed in the classroom, um, not only did I say earlier that I had to give up some of that control for each person to write about things in the week, I had to give up control in order to make it a sustainable course and to meet the needs of everyone else. I had to accept that I could not do it all. And as a result, I learned a lot more because all these people, these wonderful mo uh, mentors came in and taught me so much new information. And they were teaching my other participants as well. And finally, student questions and teacher feedback seem amplified in an open online forum. You have to be ready for the criticism, and you have to be ready for negative answers and positive answers. Um, because everything anyone writes is obviously open and online. <laughs> so anyone can see what's really going on. I learned to accept that failure was possible, learn from my mistakes, and do my best. And I think, if people ask me what made the difference, I think that being authentic got me through. So these are some guidelines on when you could use MOOCs through K-12. to You could use it as an online module or course. If you were students in a classroom, if you were students doing a project, you could use it. Teachers could use it. Administrators could use it. Districts could use it. Governments could use it. It's across the board. Um, and it's a prof so you could use it as a course, or you could use it as a professional development option. So you start as a group, and each person builds on it every week in an open online forum or more in a closed online form. So you could use just wikis. And I know Peggy talked about this. She has a great resource that we have at the end, gives you some ideas on how you could use it a little bit more in professional development. Specifically, I wrote down how to design a MOOC. And again, every single one of these resources is, is in our um, live finder. But the big thing is thinking about who is your audience and who you're creating a, wik uh, a MOOC for. Creating the Wikispaces homepage. I would totally suggest to use a wiki. I tried using a blog at first and other forums. They seemed a bit confusing. You need that permanent aspect, the fact that the page doesn't change on you. Um, and you need to set up key pages about course information, frequently asked questions, privacy resources, things. Um, you need to start looking for the experts in your topics. But remember that experts don't have to be the biggest names. It's more important to have people who really are passionate and love what they're doing, because I've definitely had the feedback that people love hearing stories and what um, people are really doing. And Peggy said that to me before, and Steve said that to me before. And the face-to-face -face recorded sessions are so important, and the idea that you have some synchronous time with people. Um, it gives them an opportunity to speak to you directly. Any, um, and if not, they can talk to you in email. But that that face-to-face -face time, I feel, in a synchronous session is just as important as almost when you're in a room with a student and they're asking you questions too. And sometimes it's easier for people because it's in a digital format. I won't uh, go into too many more details here. You can go over it. The tracking that we used, again, the mentor was David Trust in this case. Um, we used NetVibe. So if you're interested in that kind of tracking, it's all written down here. And we also used a beta version called Hash Tracking to help me with the Twitter feeds. I was able to check what people were linking, what people were talking about in Twitter, told me when people were tweeting, how many people retweeted, when people, everything I wanted to know possibly about Twitter wrote down everyone's name and what they wrote in the order that they wrote it in. This is a great tool. And people were asking me, how do I know what's going on? Well, all I needed to do was look at these two resources. And if people linked, then I would know. I'll quickly go over assessment. Now, one of the great things about this is this is, my, um, this is the badge that we'll be getting on Tuesday. And I sent out a tweet and said, can anyone help me make a badge? Because basically, I'm just too tired and don't know how to do it. And Jeremy McDonald created the badge for me. I have no idea who he is, but he kept trying and trying until we got it right. And um, that's just one more proof to how everyone can learn through this and everyone can help each other out. Um, but the assessment tool that we used, and you can see right here, 
uh, we created a Google Doc and we just tracked the activities and people would write in if they had finished the activity or not. It wasn't up to me to mark anything or I would give feedback, but I wouldn't grade anything. It was up to the person to tell me if they'd finished or not. And I based this on, and ironically, Will Richardson just came up with this beautiful assessment graph, but and he's starting to change it a bit, but he pointed out that content, again, as we've talked about, is over to the left in one part of learning, but really, this is the area, the more important part that we're working on, the synthesis, the problem solving, the creativity, curiosity, and that's what I was focusing on with the assessment, so that's why I wanted people to be able to assess things for themselves. Um, and what will you end with? You'll end with a great collection of resources. You'll have them based on a collaborative effort. And you'll develop leadership skills among your peers and ensure that everyone is identified by their strengths. And sometimes, obviously, things go wrong and we accept failure and weaknesses as well. And you will have created the foundations for autonomous learning for all participants, which will offer them the, op them the opportunities outside of the school. And you will have taken away the idea that professional development is given or learning is given and instead proven that professional development or learning is created. Now, stop talking to let my digital participants say something. So um, Shannon or Paula or Chris, this is your time. And um, maybe I'll let Chris talk first. So Chris, do you want to take the mic? Tell okay. us a bit about your course. Can everybody hear me OK? Give me a green check. Wonderful. All right, thank you. Um, I'm not sure exactly what you want me to say, but I did actually make a few notes today on my um, um, Mighty Bell page about things that I had learned. And um, first of all, I had to say it was a completely different kind of learning experience for me. Um, I had just finished up doing my master's online, and this was kind of a cross between doing those courses and um, kind of just uh, uh, surfing the web. It was this neat little mix of that. Um, and it was just really interesting to me to learn in that format. Um, I just feel like um, the world of the, the cyberspace has opened up to me and that I just had so much to explore and had all of these wonderful guides in the DigiFoot participants to help me do that. So that was huge. And I just feel like those resources are going to be available to me for a very long time. So those are probably the two biggest things that I gained from this course. Now, Shannon, thank you so much. Shannon, do you want to take the lead? Sure. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Shannon Polson, and I've had the pleasure of working uh, with Verena for the last year in a number of different areas. And when I found out that she was offering a MOOC, I'm smart enough to know that um, when Verena offers something, you jump in and you learn as much as you can from her. She's an amazing educator. So I took the course because Verena was, was um, teaching it or handling it. And I have kids um, who I'm trying to stay ahead of in terms of uh, their own <laughs> digital experiences. So I took it for that reason as well. And mostly I'm just curious about um, what's out there online. And so I took it for those reasons and was so thrilled with the amount of um, information and resources. My learning exploded over the, the last six weeks. It's been absolutely incredible. Um, I created a PLN through using Twitter and the resources that Verena had available to us. I have um, fell in love with Mighty Bell and Digo, amazing tools to use for teachers. I've been taking online sessions. Um, and all of those things I discovered through taking Verena's MOOC. So if you get a chance to go through some of the archives, you will benefit greatly, and it will just enrich your professional life so much. Um, a great experience, and very well done, Verena. So thanks for the opportunity. Thanks, Shannon. Um, thanks, Shannon. And Paula, I guess if you'd like to say anything, um, I'll leave it to you. And, and that's it for my DigiFoot. Thank you, Verena. This is Paula Noggle. Um, I saw this um, MOOC 
offered, I believe I saw it on Twitter for the um, first time, I had actually participated in three different MOOCs over my summer vacation this year, and Digifoot 12 was one of them. Um, I have to say it was the best organized one that I um, participated in. It had us going in every direction possible. At first, it was like, ah, they're throwing another thing in it for us to go look at. And I, you know, I learned some new tools, such as Mighty Bell, which was awesome. And I was very excited to, to learn how to use it. Um, I was disappointed to find out that I cannot use that particular tool with my fourth graders because of their terms of service. But um, that's OK. I understand how that happens. But as I told um, someone at the beginning of the coursework, the reason that I jumped on this is when I saw the title, I am very interested in teaching my 9 and 10 year old students how to properly interact in online spaces and how to build a positive digital footprint. Um, what we do in my classroom is probably one of their first um, monitored online exposures. I don't think that all of them come from households where their parents are quite savvy enough to maybe monitor their online behavior properly or to teach them how to properly use the online environment. So I spend a lot of time at the beginning of the year um, in Edmodo, which can be a closed learning management system, teaching them how to um, interact online. And I just wanted to get as many resources and as many ideas from the collective brain that was part of the Digifoot 12 MOOC as possible. And I was very successful in doing that. I have lots and lots of resources. And one of the things that I would like to do is I would like to make a mini MOOC for my parents. So that's one of my goals. Thank you so much um, for offering this. And it was a wonderful opportunity. And I hope everybody gets a chance to do it. That's a great idea, Paula. Thank you so much for that. And I think what all three of you have pointed out is everyone came in with different um, reasons to be there, including Peggy in the chat box there. And, uh, Everyone gets what they want out of a MOOC. And, and again, a hard thing for the facilitator is you can't control what everybody wants to learn. But on the other hand, the learning that comes out is spontaneous, and you do get what you want to learn out of it. So the next step for me is taking it to the K-12 world, and we'll see how that goes. But I'm going to uh, say goodbye and give it hand it over to Steve. I don't know. <laughs> it's been handed over to me. Did you want me to say anything in particular or just kind of describe the site? I think I want you to describe the site and what you saw out of it and the direction that you'd like to see it go, or the MOOCME site in particular. Sure. I don't know that I necessarily have a direction I'd like to go, but I uh, really love what Verena has done. And, um, and because of the association that I have with Blackboard Collaborate and the um, sort of generosity that they allow me in providing spaces for uh, educational opportunities, wanted to create a place where people could come and actually set up a MOOC, um, learn a little bit about the history of the MOOC, and then if they wanted to, to um, utilize some of the resources, uh, at least the ones I can provide to do so. So uh, if you go to MOOC.me, www.mooc.me. Um, there is information there. You can actually, whether or not you're running a MOOC using the resources that I have or using other resources, you can actually put it, put it into a listing there and it will get published. Uh, we've only had three or four go up, but um, hopefully it, it becomes a good list for people. If not, uh, hopefully there's another place that where that happens. And then you can also email me and I'll help you get set up with uh, using Blackboard Collaborate for that synchronous piece. Um, and I th oh, and I did want to mention NINGS, uh, because one of the advantages to NINGS that most people don't remember is that you can use them basically as an email uh, tool. And so Verena, the group that Verena created in Student 2.0 meant that she was able to email everybody very easily. So if you can find an existing Ning and become a group of that, you don't have to pay any Ning fees because somebody else is already taking care of that. But you can use it as a very good tool for emailing and um, kind of keeping track of your group. So certainly you're welcome to do that with any of my 
things, if there's a space you want to be in. They're all open for that. You don't even have to ask permission. You just create a group and can go from there. So I think that's pretty much it. Again, MOOC at me is sort of spaghetti thrown against the wall. It's another one of those following the inner voice projects. Um, you know, certainly there's just some terrific history here uh, around uh, the the constructivist participative aspects of MOOCs that gets lost a little in the in the discussions of the Stanford and Harvard uh, and the other uh, massive MOOCs rather than the meaningful MOOCs. So I love that distinction. And if MOOC.me can help you, please feel free to use it and email me if I can do anything else for you. Anyway, congratulations, Marina. Thanks, everybody. So I. I just put in my contact information, and I think, oh, I think uh, Peggy's going to take over from here. So that's it, and um, there you go. Peggy, you can take over. Great. Thank you so much. I'm going to go ahead and take over, and this is Kim. Um, this is Brenda's contact information, and um, you can download the slides or take care um watch the recording and uh, take care of this information. She's online and she's quite accessible. And we want to let you know that Steve's going to be interviewing Roger Shank on, I think that's how you pronounce it, on August 14th and on August 16th. Paolo Blixing, I don't know why Steve you picked these people that have just Okay, Roger's rescheduling. The most difficult names every time I go through these. Like I just have such a hard time with them. Anyway, um, we want to let you know that there's going to be a free virtual conference um, from August 10th through the 24th. It's going to be the Connected Educator Month offering. And it's going to be the Learning 2.0 conference with lots and lots of keynotes and sessions going on. Um, fantastic people, some of the highest, highest, uh, greatest leaders in ed tech. And so, Steve, if you'll take the mic and talk a little bit more about that and what we can expect with the keynotes and presenters, that'd be great. Yes, yeah, so this conference does have some great keynoters, um, including Sagata Mitra and Yang Zhao. Um, you just have to go to Learning Tool and see the list, you'd be blown away. However, this conference is actually about participation, and it's all about um, helping uh, peer professional development, just like Marina's talking about. And I like to think of these virtual conferences as kind of like the MOOC, that they're just a space for people to teach each other. So there is still an opportunity, excuse me, we want you to present. Uh, if you, the whole idea is to, is to talk about uh, teaching and learning in the age of the internet, and the goal is to get uh, you speaking to each other. There's a very short timeline here because of getting this into Connected Educator Month, so we know it's uh, fast and furious, but if you would like to, we'd love to have you either attend or present or both. Thanks, everybody. Great. Thanks, Steve. And if you go to that website, um, you can find out all kinds of information about uh, submitting a proposal, the schedule, and how you can participate as a presenter or just as a uh, participant. So we encourage you to explore the Learning 2.0 conference that's coming up very, very shortly. And we want to let you know this is our schedule. On August the 18th, we're going to have a featured teacher, Elvira Damcourt. And on August 25th, Danica Barker talking about using Web 2.0 tools. September 1st, we're not going to have a show for the Labor Day holiday in the United States. And September 8th, we're going to be talking with TJ Shea and the Fable Vision Ambassadors, if you know anything about that. That's going to be really exciting, the International Dot Day. That's going to be really cool. And Class Dojo, um, the behavior management system on September 15th. So those are going to be really exciting shows that we're going to be having for our schedule. So that's going to be um, uh, exciting. Mark your calendar for that. And if you know of a great educator that is working with students or colleagues, please, please let us know. 
You can put it in the survey that's going to open today, right when you exit the survey, or any at any time you can fill out um, the form to nominate a teacher or educator by going to CR tinyurl.com slash cr20live featured teacher n o m i a n a t and that is part of the live binder um, form and you can see that as well um, anytime you need to go to the live binder all of the forms are accessible through that so please nominate um, a featured teacher or educator that you'd like to see um, in a future session. When you exit, a survey will automatically open in your browser. And if for some reason it doesn't, you can always go to tinyurl.com slash cr20live survey. And if you watch one of the recordings, you can also go to that same link at any time. Just let us know which session you watched, and Peggy will take care of it and make sure that you get the a certificate for that session. And you can always let us know, and we'll take care of that. And you can also click on the link in the chat box that she just put there for you. It will open in your browser as well, in case that um, doesn't work automatically for you. But it should open automatically for you. And this is a copy of the certificate. And you can take that and submit it as well. Absolutely, you sure can. And we want to give a very special thank you to Steve and Verena and all of the uh, people who presented and gave their input today for presenting and giving their input to um, today's presentation, as well as Tammy for doing the closed captioning for us each and every week, and Lori uh, for assisting with questions. And so now we're going to go ahead and go back to some questions that we might have missed or haven't had a chance to answer. I took down a few of them. And somebody had asked uh, what the difference between a PLP and a PLN is. And Raina, if you could maybe address that for Vincent, that would be great. Oh, yes. Oh, talking about our, I apologize, uh, Verena. We also have, um, for some reason, I'm not getting all of the, the slides. Um, we have an iTunes U channel that you can sign up for. And if you want the MP3s or the MP4s, you can go directly to the iTunes U channel just by clicking on that link that Peggy put in. Um, by going to tinyurl.com slash cr20live iTunes U. That will open automatically up into uh, iTunes U for you. And then you can subscribe and take us with you wherever you go on your iPod or iPhone. There's also an RSS feed that you can subscribe to on our website on the archives and uh, and resources page if you didn't want to use the iTunes pay, uh, iTunes route. And you could go that way using any RSS feed aggregator and go that way. And that's the link to our archives and resources page. And you could use that as well and use that RSS feed. So either way that works for you. It, that's more convenient, you could do that as well. And at any time you wanted to, the Live Binder has all the resources, but at any time you wanted to um, view a recording or an MP3 or find the Live Binder link or anything like that, you can go to our archives and resources page and find out the information from the past show and all of the links that were shared. So um, we encourage you to check that as well um, and, and keep up with that. That's a great link to have and to bookmark in your browser. Anything else that I forgot, Peggy, before we pass it back to questions? 
if so, just type a note in the chat. Pam Cranford will be coming back. We will be going back and talking about uh, Symbaloo web mixes, so make sure you're working on your web mixes. Um, and, and I took down that uh, question about the parents. Um, how do you convince the parents that their child can learn this way without the teacher directing and grading everything? Verena, if you could address that after the PLP and PLM question. I'll, I'll try to do the PLP, PLM question first. I, uh, the PLP, maybe I need some, I need to know what it stands for exactly, but PLN is, has a million different versions as well, but usually it's personal learning network or passionate learning network. Um, PLP, does anyone know personal learning? I don't know. Practices. Thank you, Viz. <laughs> okay. Oh, okay. The network is, okay. there we go. So the there network you. would be more the more people you connect with. Yeah. The network would be more the people who you connect with and the foundation of support that you have and the practices would be, it could be the portfolio or the actual tools, in my opinion. Those, those would be the differences or the practices would be how you teach or how you learn online. Um, there you go. So those then there's, yes, there's PLC, Professional Learning Community, yeah. <laughs> to confuse it. things even further. Um, yes, and then, they, yeah, uh, the P, yeah. The one about the parents, um, the parents. how to convince the parents that their child can learn this way? Well, I think for me, the, the biggest thing for me is I live in Canada. And I have to admit, there's a huge difference between teaching in Canada and teaching in the United States, because we don't have the emphasis, emphasis on standardized tests that you do. Um, so we are lucky, because we will have more of an opportunity. However, parents still want marks, 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 as well as everyone else. So I actually love Paula's idea that she came up with on creating a wiki about learning about all these different ideas and, and learning together. Because I think as we're learning with connected educators, the only way um, to, to engage in more meaningful learning is to bridge that learning with more people. So I, I, I think that would be a start. You have to have a parent night, absolutely. But creating even a course for us all to learn together would be a great opportunity. And all you can do is keep doing it. And I've worked in private schools where I love the students and the parents are the most uh, difficult uh, aspect of the job sometimes. Um, but the parents, you have to remember that their heart is in to the best uh, opportunity for their their child, and the best opportunity might be n not well, obviously not necessarily the grade. So it's talking to them about it and giving them those opportunities. So nights, as I say, and uh, that course is a great idea. Um, and and we, does that kind of answer it? Yes, and that's a good point that Canada is not as focused on standardized testing on as yeah. much as. So. Uh, as the United States. I know that's a, a huge issue here. Um, another question was, um, yes. how about D assessment? Give everyone all the badges at the start and then take them away as the, court, as the course progresses. I think the assessment piece, as I said, is going to be the next um, study. Uh, because assessment has become a huge issue in education in itself right now. Um, and I know that, that is going to become one of my big issues bringing this to the K-12 world. And I thought of it like the scouts or the brownies and the badges. Um, and if you started from K-12, to you can do all sorts of different badges as you go up. And, it, and by the end, you've got like a blanket, I guess you could see yourself, with all these different experiences. And then if teachers found out about it, they'd think, well, why? Why couldn't I give my, my kids that opportunity by doing a module or, or something? So yeah, I think the badge idea, the badges idea, and I put a little bit of information on that in the resources, is a way to go. But again, I need to do more uh, research on it. Everyone does. <laughs> and Paula, did you have a question or a comment? Paula has her hand up. Yeah, I just wanted to. Um, make a statement about the parents and parental involvement. Um, yeah. I've been working with my students on blogging, and Moto, and you know, doing a lot of things online. 
and um, basically what I do is I just go ahead and I start doing it. Um, you know, my I, my kids do have um, uh, the parents on something at the beginning of each year, but I don't even think they realize what they're signing. And then all of a sudden, you know, the students are blogging and they're um, interacting in a um, learning environment. And opportunities arise and the parents get curious and they want to know, well, what, what is this? You know, what's going on? So one of the things to do is to host some parents. And last year, um, one of the things that I did was we had a blog commenting party after school to bring the parents in. The children pulled out their netbooks, opened up their blogs. We actually um, created a blog commenting video that we kind of did a remix from Linda Yolis's one blog commenting video that her students created. Um, we went through the steps with the parents and we taught the parents how to comment because they weren't they weren't participating in the at all. Um, some of them didn't even know their students had their child had a blog. Um, and then I just want to give you one other quick story. Uh, my children had a chance to be live Twitter reporters um, for a project that was done with the Destrehan Plantation for their Heritage Day. And the parents had to sign a permission slip allowing their children to be a leader. Well, I picked 25 students that I knew could handle this because I'd worked with them pretty much all year. And one of the parents did not sign the permission slip. And I was like, OK, so I picked a different student. And um, that particular parent came on the field trip with us. And when she saw what was involved and how it was um, such a wonderful learning opportunity for the students, because what they were doing was they were watching live reenactments um, on the plantation. Then they would go to what was called the barn, where they had iPads set up and a Wi-Fi connection. And they would take notes as they watched the live demonstration. They would go to the barn, and they would tweet about what they just saw um, using um, a school district Twitter account. And it was an awesome experience. And the parent that had not signed the permission slip said she did so much and that if that opportunity ever arose again, it would be first in line to sign the permission slip. So you just have to work with them and let them see what's going on and give them the opportunity to make decisions. And when they see the educational value that it offers, a lot of them will be right on board with you. Thanks. Awesome. That's excellent. That's exciting. For and, and that's educating the parents is just as important as educating the students. I think um, to get the support and the buy-in, as well as educating other colleagues. Lori, did were there any questions that I missed? Okay. Where is there any questions that I missed? Um, just click on the hand with the arrow if you'd like to use your mic or continue to type them in the chat before we let everybody go uh, for the weekend. Because it looks like the questions are kind of winding down. We want to thank everybody for joining us and uh, Verena and all of the Digifoot Detective participants for joining us today and sharing their ideas and their experiences in the class and giving us so many ideas that we can try with our students and giving us the courage to try these with our students. Um, and as Paula said, to do a mini MOOC and, and start small and to uh, give us the courage to expand and, and until we can do a, a regular MOOC, a massive one. And um, this is a great example for us. And Steve seems like he's also ha um, made it easy for us at the MOOC.me, I believe it was, um, so that we could kind of follow an example. And there's a question, uh, Paula, are you doing this within Edmodo or within personal blogs? I'm sorry, you're talking about the mini MOOC? The mini MOOC. Your, your activities. Um, or just on the district Twitter. 
Oh, on the district Twitter, um, that was through the district Twitter account. I have up on my own classroom Twitter account, and I'm going to start using that this year. In the past, I have tweeted out on my personal Twitter account, um, you know, after we've done a Skype call or to mention that we are a Skype call, like if we've done a mystery Skype call, they'll say, oh, we did a mystery Skype call with so-and-so, and we've learned that they were located in blank. And, um, um, one of the things I taught my kids was to put their first name, last initial, in parentheses at the end of their tweet so that we could find it in the tweet, the Twitter stream. And they love that. What about the blogging that you do with your students and parents? I use, okay, I use the kidblog.org platform because, okay. again, it works very well for my fourth graders. It is um, under a teacher-controlled dashboard. It can be as open or as closed as you need it to be for your district guidelines. I start off with it closed and then I open it up. And I use the hashtag comments for kids on Twitter to generate lots of global comments. Great. Great. And again, you do need to teach the parents how to, and then the students, how to comment properly and appropriately. Kind of like Mick teaches um, paper uh, commenting, paper blogging activity, and uh, we appreciate all that Steve does to help set these things up for us with Mighty Bell and the MOOC and all that MOOC.me, so that we can uh, start these things and kind of have a shell for us already started. So thank you, Steve, for those things as well. Well, it looks like the comments have, and the questions have kind of slowed down. So we're going to let everybody go and have a wonderful weekend. Yes, shells are su and support are key, very much so. And we thank everybody so much for joining us. Be sure to um, join us next week. We're going to have an excellent session. We uh, thank you so much. We'll be here at the same time. Um, well, the schedule will not change until Labor Day, so we're back in session full time, uh, same time, same place. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining us. Um, have a great weekend, and we hope to see everybody online during the week. And don't forget the um, Learning 2.0 conference. It started yesterday. It's going on all every day. There are keynotes. They are fantastic sessions, so check into that as well. That's going to be great. That's going to, they're just such high, high quality sessions. So um, we really hope that you'll check that out. So have a great day. Take care, everybody, and have a wonderful Saturday. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.